On this broadcast, we have covered the Mormon Church. I even wrote a, just a brief summary of Mormonism in my book, Sacred Cows. But there's a lot about the Mormon Church that we still don't know, and it's crazy. And it's really interesting, and it's something I wanted to address. And so I have a very special guest here. Bryce Blankenagle is a, do I have this right, a secular Mormon? That is correct, Seth, yes. And there's a distinction between Mormon, ex-Mormon, and secular Mormon. So that's a proper introduction. Thank you. Help me out. Secular Mormon. What is that? Well, in much the way that you think of like an ex-convict or an ex-married person or something to that effect, they've left something behind. But when I, you know, I don't believe in the Mormon church, but I'm still a product of its culture. I'm a secular Mormon the way that a person who doesn't believe in the Jewish faith but grew up in it is a secular Jew. And, you know, I'm still, I, I still hold many parts of that culture within me and I still identify with the Mormon people. So I don't necessarily like the term ex-Mormon as much as I do secular Mormon. If I'm a secular Jew, though, you know, I'm doing the, the, the practices of Judaism as ritual and culture. But I don't believe in, you know, a, the God of Judaism, so to speak. Exactly. Uh, yes. So, do you practice the ritual and tradition of Mormonism? I I don't. I mean, I don't go to the temple because you have to be, you know, a, a paid up member, paying tithing, and and have your temple recommended everything. But I I still identify with the language of the culture, with the deeper doctrine of it. I'm still extremely familiar with a, a lot of the people, and you know, most of my family members are still members of the church. So it's it's just a, a massive culture, and it's a very a very insular com kind of community. And it's something that I you know I don't want to leave behind. It's something that I identify with. I'm a product of it. Well, I have to ask this though, Bryce. I mean, would you agree that they're teaching falsehoods? The church is telling <laughs> things that are not true. So to see an affinity for the Mormon church, someone like me, many in our audience are thinking, you know, that, that seems odd to us. How would you address that? Well, that's a, that's a bit of a distinction, and it's actually one that I have to make frequently on my show. Is I don't uh, I don't have an issue with Mormons. I have an issue with Mormonism, and the way that I am able to parse out being a secular Mormon and identifying with Mormons is I don't I don't identify with the Mormon religion. I identify with the culture and with the people that are a product of that culture. So it's it's a very simple distinction, but it it. Does, it's very powerful and distinct in the fact that what I talk about is about Mormonism, the, the history of the Mormon religion specifically. But I don't talk about Mormons on my show, and I, I, don't make, no, I don't take any issue with Mormons. I just would like to educate as many as I possibly can. You get any traction with them? I mean, you know, are, are they like, hey, Bryce, we're so glad you told us about... You know, Mormonism from the perspective of a secular person. Do you get that? Yes, I uh, I spend a lot of time at Mormon history conferences. Actually, there are a small handful of those that happen, you know, all over the states every year. And it's I found that it's a lot easier to engage in a conversation when I come to the table saying that I'm a secular Mormon instead of an ex Mormon, uh, because ex Mormon implies that you are in apostasy, and people will often throw up a barrier and will not have the conversation with you. But if you do uh, introduce yourself or you identify as a secular Mormon, it's a lot less inflammatory and you can you can make significant headway even with friends and family members by not saying that I, I left the religion and I left the culture behind but by saying that I still embrace it even though I don't believe in the uh, the truth claims of the religion well if I was to try to pin you down and you don't have to answer but if you don't believe you don't believe in gods anywhere no, no God no not at all. You're an atheist. No, I'm a, I, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool atheist, and I, I actually, um, uh, on a personal note, I have you to thank for that, because when I listened to the Bloody Bible episode many, many years ago, um, that introduced my uh, kind of critical thinking about religion and Christianity, and um, I, I've been a fan of your show ever since, because you've you've been able to cause me to become what I consider a thinking atheist. You know, I know that you don't typically wear the moniker of the thinking atheist. You're Seth Andrews of the thinking atheist. Um, but you you caused me to become a thinking atheist, and for that, I thank you dearly. Dude, that makes my day. It makes my month. Well, you know, many people don't, <laughs> like, from, and someone is newly introduced to me, and they'll introduce me to, like, a, a tour stop or whatnot occasionally, and I always try to get them in advance and remind them that, you know, I come out of a faith culture. 
you mm-hmm. come out of a faith culture. You know, fake it till you make it, go with the flow, feel it in the spirit. You know, mm-hmm. it's better to believe than to know. And so the thinking atheist icon was really a reminder to myself and everybody else, let's let's find out. I'd rather know than just believe. Let's think about it and engage our brains. And and then, you know, when people think I, in the world of these amazing minds, uh, you know, if the idea that I would pitch myself as the thinking atheist seems rather presumptuous, and I always am quick to, to correct him. You know, I'm, I'm the guy who yeah, thought donkeys absolutely. could talk for 30 years, right? I'm the guy, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a great thinker. I'm just a guy who's trying to figure it out every single day like everybody else. Hey, man, for, for the first two-thirds of my life, I believed that a guy translated golden plates out of a, you know, a rock in a hat. And, um, you know, so we, we, we all had some ability to compartmentalize that mythology and still believe that it's somehow, you know, maps to reality, even though we can look back on that time in our lives and just wonder, how did I ever get there? How did I reconcile that cognitive dissonance? And it doesn't make sense to us now, but at the time it does. Looking at uh, a portrait, you know, of, of a religion, you're so close to it that you you see nothing else around it. You, you know, you're just <laughs> yeah. blind, you know. And yep. then later on, when you walk away and you see the full picture in focus, you just shake your head and you lament the years lost and you wonder <laughs> why was I so thick. And, and uh, but you know, uh, you yeah. and I can also address, I think, because we have behind the scenes knowledge, these claims that religious people are, are stupid or they're, you know, insane or, or whatnot. I mean, m- many times they're talking about conditioning, indoctrination, so many other things. Were you indoctrinated growing up? Absolutely. Uh, For some reason, religions often require a level of indoctrination, um, especially for children, in order to believe. Um, You know, and and we as atheists will typically use the throwaway line, you know, God is Santa Claus for adults, uh, because, you know, we we compartmentalize what we're able to rationally parse out in our mind when it comes to our everyday lives, whether it's mathematics or science or, or history or whatever the case may be. But then somehow we're able to keep these beliefs in this separate place in our mind and never apply that same rationality that we do to, you know, driving our cars and using our cell phones and sending rockets to Mars or, well, let's combine it, sending cars to Mars, right? Um, And we don't apply that rationality to these faith claims. And that does represent a serious failing of our human mind. We should be able to apply that, you know, harsh white light of scrutiny to everything in our lives. John Loftus talks about the outsider test for faith and how we use different... We'll get into Mormonism in just a second, folks. Uh, But he talks about how we use different criteria to talk about other religions. So when you were in the Mormon faith, you probably looked at like Scientology and Islam and whatnot. And you were like, (laughs) show me the proof, show me the evidence, you know, bring the... Uh, bring something that will convince me, but you use totally different criteria for your own faith. And I was the same. But if you want, you can actually look at many religions, explorations, and criticisms of other religions and find help because they've already sort of debunked them. They just haven't debunked their own. I found that fascinating. So. Well, I, yeah, and this has actually uh, garnered a, an appreciation in my own mind for studying history, and particularly comparative religions. And w- I mean, we might as well use this as a segue to get into Mormonism, because um, Mormonism specifically is one of very few world religions where the founding prophet of it came about in the post-Enlightenment world, in the, in the Industrial Revolution, you know, somebody we have court documents for. Some, you know, we don't have the court documents for Jesus. So the, the history of Mormonism is much more documentable than most other religions, and it, it has led people from the outside to view Mormonism as this wacky and fun kind of thing, and especially the founding prophet, Joseph Smith, as something to kind of point a finger and laugh at and say, how can anybody believe that? But we don't have the same level of documentation to uh, disprove the truth claims of other religions. So Mormonism does kind of stand out specifically along with, you know, Scientology and um, Jehovah's Witnesses, because it's become it's come after the enlightenment period and we have so much documentation not only from the founding people of it but from people who are outsiders and contemporaries of the founding period you know when i talk about mormonism we cover some of the basics the stuff that most people like to pinball around you know we got the magic <laughs> underwear and you got the seer stone and you got the golden plates and palmyra new york and joseph smith and you know, the angels, and well, we, we know the story, but there's so much more. There's so many other layers to this onion, and this has sort of been the focus of your study. So 
take me down that trail. I mean, what are some things about Mormonism that we don't know that we should? Well, and I'm, I'm glad you let it in that way because everything that the outside populace knows of Mormonism and the large majority of chapel attending Mormons is about Joseph Smith because he is the founding prophet. He had the vision in the sacred grove of God and Jesus who told him that all the religions are evil. You know, he is this, this catalyst that created Mormonism essentially. But that created, you know, that was created in New York in Palmyra, as you said, and Mormons don't typically associate Mormonism with New York. It's a Utah religion. But Joseph Smith never set foot in Utah. So it, it, we kind of lose something in translation here. How did the Mormons come to set up in Utah territory and, you know, create what we call uh, what, what secular Mormons like to call Morador? That's the Mormon corridor. <laughs> Uh, and you really wonder if Joseph Smith never set foot there, then how did Utah become the headquarters? Well, this is, you know, as you said, Seth, Mormonism is much like an onion. You, you peel back layers and it just gets crazier and crazier and more uh, distilled and distinct with the deeper you get. And the more you peel it back, the more it makes you cry, unfortunately. So what, what I've brought to the table today is the life and times of Brigham Young. Because Joseph Smith is this founding prophet, but Brigham Young was responsible for so much more, and nobody knows much about Brigham Young outside of Mormon historian circles. But he led an extremely fascinating and exciting life. And one thing to understand about Brigham Young is he's venerated in Utah as an important individual of history. I mean, there are three universities named after him, a city, a number of Utah roads. Uh, there are statues that pepper the Utah desert at every visitor center and church location. So, you know, Brigham Young, to have this much uh, veneration, he must have been an important guy. So, Let's talk about him. Let's maybe by the end of this conversation, Seth, you and I are going to understand why Brigham Young is so highly revered and venerated in the Mormon community. Would you say he's uh, more revered than Joseph Smith even? No, absolutely not. Because Joseph Smith, um, well, Joseph Smith is like the fun and wacky kind of part of the religion. And we uh, Brigham Young was able to basically create a cardboard cutout of Joseph Smith and distill his history and clean it up and put out a, a systematic uh, history of the church in 1852 that just cleaned up anything bad about Joseph Smith and turned him into basically a legend. But Brigham Young wasn't so courteous with his own history. Um, and that's oftentimes why we don't talk much about Brigham Young, because the skeletons in his closet are, well, let's just say his skeleton closet is a lot bigger than Joseph Smith's. Smith, you know, he, he was a charlatan. You know, he was uh, out there looking for treasures and selling his <laughs> services and making a shit ton of money, or supposedly, I guess. And then he ends up in, he, was, had to, I, he had to jet from town to escape authorities and i think he was in jail at one point or another you know he, the guy was uh he was a snake oil salesman is is that an accurate yeah. way to, to frame him yeah well let's go ahead and walk through that so mormonism began in 1830 in new york as we've covered and then two years after that brigham young joined the church and they moved to ohio because kirtland ohio was where the headquarters of the church was and that's where joseph smith met a guy named sydney rigdon now, Sidney Rigdon was a Baptist preacher. He had hundreds of parishioners, and he injected an adrenaline shot of parishioners into Mormonism by converting his followers in the Kirtland and Mentor, Ohio area. And this is, this is about 30, 40 miles outside of Cleveland, just to give listeners a, a bit of an idea of where the kind of location we're talking about. But Ohio wasn't that great for, for the early Mormons there, and um, they ran into a severe amount of financial difficulties. So Brigham Young... Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon, they're kind of uh, three of these prominent figureheads in early Mormonism. And when Brigham Young joined in 1832, he started moving his way up into the ranks of becoming a trusted Mormon elite, as I like to call. So the uh, by the time 1837 rolled around, Joseph Smith had about forty to $60,000 in personal debt. To put some perspective on that, the higher number, that's about $1.3 million in 2016 money, and that was all in his own personal name. So in order to answer those debts, the Mormons decided to open up what was known as the Kirtland Safety Society Anti-Banking Company. 
And this, what they did is they printed what was known as rag money. It was their money that was their own proprietary banking notes. And they would take in money, you know, dollars and, and gold uh, from the Mormons, from the Mormon parishioners, and they would trade it for this, this rag money. And they were speculating on this. Well, the Panic of 1837 hit, which is basically the Great Depression 0.5. And it collapsed and a lot of Mormons lost a lot of money and people were mad. So Joseph Smith, Brigham Young and Sidney Rigdon were chased out of Ohio and were forced to set up shop in Missouri. And this is uh, far west Missouri became the new Mormon headquarters. So the, the, the history of Mormonism in Missouri is convoluted in and of itself. We can't go into it because we'll lose sight of the central point of Brigham Young here. But essentially... 1838 was the first was the only year that the Mormons really set up shop in Missouri uh, as the the primary headquarters, and that was you know their second mass exodus because the Mormons had moved from New York, their original place, to Ohio, and then they were chased from Ohio to Missouri. But the 1838 Mormon War in Missouri happened, which landed Joseph Smith in jail, and that put Brigham Young in a rare position to be a leading force organizing the third Mormon exodus exodus from Missouri to Illinois. So as soon as Joseph Smith is behind bars, Brigham Young, the opportunist, says, hey, you know, this is a great chance, an opportunity to maneuver into a place of power and authority, greater power and authority, correct? Exactly. So Brigham Young at this time was essentially the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And to give a little background, the Mormon leadership and hierarchy was essentially set up uh, similar to the United States government, where they had the uh, prophet and president of the church with his closest advisors, and then they had the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and the High Council. And these three uh, different bodies essentially made up the power structure. And, and when any one of them was removed, the power would default back to the other bodies until they could reorganize who was you know, removed or who died or who was uh, apostatized and excommunicated or whatever the case may be. So Brigham Young was head of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, this governing body, who took over power while Joseph Smith was locked in jail with his brother Hiram Smith for arson, robbery, and high treason against the Union. Kind of a sketchy dude. What, what were the charges? <laughs> Robbery, uh, arson, and what? And high treason against the Union. Um, and and this is this goes to the uh, 1838 Mormon War in Missouri. Uh, there's there's <laughs> this is a huge huge topic. Um, but essentially, the Mormons uh, they committed war atrocities against the state of Missouri and their militias. And they were uh, they eventually the the Mormon headquarters in Far West was surrounded by about 2,500 militiamen. And Joseph Smith and uh, his elites had to surrender. But Brigham Young had rode, you know, ridden off in the middle of the night to escape being caught. So Brigham Young was um, kind of the leading figurehead who took over the power in this interim period of five months as the Mormons were organizing their mass exodus to Illinois during the bitter cold winter of 1838 to 39. Can you tell me about the demise of Joseph Smith, how he died? Yes. So the period from 1840 to 1844 were the Nauvoo years of Mormonism. This is Nauvoo, Illinois, right on the Mississippi. And this is termed as the kingdom on the Mississippi because Joseph Smith was building his theocratic kingdom. He had the Nauvoo Legion, which was, uh, you know, a comprise of about two to 3,000 fighting men and service was compulsory. Uh, and, and to put some perspective on that, two to 3,000 fighting men is larger than most state militia at that time. Um, in 1844, Nauvoo was about two to three times the population of Chicago. So, and I, I mean, this place was absolutely huge. Uh, there was anywhere from about 15 to 20,000 believing Mormons living in the area. So this represented a massive voting block. Um, the Mormons had a lot of political power in Nauvoo. And finally, in 1844, Joseph Smith decides to run for president of the United States. And not a lot of people know that, but he ran for president with his uh, with Sidney Rigdon as his vice president. Some may expect that that should have been Brigham Young, but uh, given Joseph's history with Sidney Rigdon, he was the proper fit. So 
Joseph Smith actually may be the first presidential candidate who was assassinated during his presidential campaign. This happened in 1844. There was a a paper that published known as the Nauvoo Expositor out of Nauvoo. They published an expose on Joseph Smith and the practice of polygamy. And he committed the printing press to be burned and all of the remaining copies of the Nauvoo Expositor to be destroyed in the street in the middle of the night, which was an act of tyranny. You're silencing free speech. He was locked in jail and then he was summarily assassinated in that jail. So the mob just lynches him essentially when he's not literally, but it was mob justice. Exactly. Uh, and it's, it, it was a different time back then. That's, that's, it was a time when mob rule was really the rule. It was a mobocracy in many instances when people weren't uh, pleased, when uh, there were uh, go- government elected officials weren't doing the will of the people. They would form a mob and they would you know exert their will in vigilante justice the way that they saw fit. And Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram were uh, casualties to this kind of mentality. Too bad he wasn't enjoying the safe walls of Mormador, where he might have been protected from. The, it's just such a great word, Mormador. <laughs> it is, isn't it? <laughs> I got to use that somewhere. All well, right. So now, I mean, I guess the any restraint is off Brigham Young, right? I mean, now there's nothing to hold him back. Is that correct? That's correct. And Joseph Smith left succession instructions for upwards of 11 people uh, at the time of his death. So a lot of people came forward and said, I'm the rightful successor. I'm supposed to be the next prophet. But Brigham Young lobbied that the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles should be the governing body in the interim period until they elect a new Mormon prophet. And the election would be by the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, essentially. Um, But there were people like James Strang, Alpheus Cutler, uh, Joseph Smith III, which was Joseph's own son. He was, uh, I believe, 11 or 12 years old at the time that his father died. Um, There there was what what I call the schism grenade, because when Joseph died in 1844, it was just this explosion of Mormon factions going off in all different directions. So the two frontrunners were James Strang and Brigham Young, and they basically split the Mormons down the middle, but it was up to each Mormon to decide who they wanted to follow. So James Strang took his Mormons up to Beaver Island in, in Wisconsin, and Brigham Young decided to organize the fourth mass exodus of Mormons out to Utah, the Great Basin. And this was not Utah at the time, it was Mexico. But with the Compromise of 1850, the territory of Utah was created and Brigham Young was elected as, well, um, instated, not necessarily elected, but instated as the first governor over the territory. Is this like a dictatorship? I mean, for lack of a better word, is the, does he have totalitarian rule over the entire religion or what? I, there's no combination of words that I could use to illustrate how much of a theocracy Brigham Young established in Utah. He was God out there. There's no other way of putting that. So he says it, we do it. He says, jump, we say how high. His word is law. Absolutely. So this is when Brigham Young, in my mind, becomes bloody Brigham Young. Because, well, let me set the scene here. So the question stands, what did Utah look like when Brigham Young and the first companies got there in 1847? They landed July 24th, 1847. Brigham Young landed um, uh, up above what is, you know, modern day Salt Lake City. And he planted his staff and said, this is the right place. And there's a monument that exists there today um, in, in Pioneer Square. So this is an important time in Utah history. And Utah was, uh, is a desert. I mean, it was the wild frontier and it was ruled by Native Americans. Nobody wanted to settle in Utah, which made it perfect for the Mormons because they were able to put their nose to the grindstone and create a place, create an oasis amidst a vast swath of desert that nobody else would bother them in. And Brigham Young used this geographic isolation to his advantage to create this Mormon theocracy. So at the time, the natives were living in um, homeostasis with the the uh, all of the wildlife around them. They would never waste anything. They were hunting and you know nomadic tribes that would uh, they lived in this this kind of uh, economic balance with the wildlife there. But then you suddenly have thousands of European settlers that are moving to this place with severely limited resources, and something had to give. 
So once it was understood that the natives would not convert to Mormonism and ally with um, Brigham Young to overthrow the United States government, the only solution remained was genocide. There were too many Mormons, and the natives were just trying to live on the Utah land, but the Mormons wanted to live there too. This is something that a lot of people don't know about the Mormon church. Like, you know, when I was first introduced, I just thought, you know, they're just happy, weird people. I mean, you know, they're just, <laughs> they're good people. They just yeah, go yeah. and they run some weird beliefs and they do their thing and they got their underwear and whatnot. But when you look into Mormon history, you know, many are surprised by just how bloody it is. Can you get into more of the massacre? What happened? Absolutely. So let me, I'm, I'm actually going to um, read a couple of quotes, and this is coming from Will Bagley's Blood of the Prophets. And for anyone who wants a very brief overview of Joseph Smith's Mormonism uh, and a very detailed uh, dissertation on the Mormon Reformation period and the Mountain Meadows Massacre and a number of these very complicated and disturbing pieces of Mormon history, I would highly recommend this book. It's it's just amazing. So when the Mormon Mormons first arrived in Utah, they tried a peaceful settlement with the natives, but unfortunately that quickly soured. And here's a quote from Brigham Young taken from Blood of the Prophets. It says, quote, as the Lord lives, we are bound to become a sovereign state in the union or an independent nation by ourselves, end quote. So, I mean, this is a complicated time that Brigham Young was truly building the Mormon theocracy, but he was still keeping in line with Joseph's uh, initial idea that the Book of Mormon was created for to Christianize the Native Americans and rally them together into one massive tribe and overthrow the American government to instate a Mormon theocracy. Brigham Young did everything possible that he could, but once he realized that these natives wouldn't become Mormons, that's when they ran into problems. So the the next quote I'm going to read is actually a little bit long, but I think it properly illustrates the turning point in the relations between the Native Americans and the Mormons happening around 1850. So this is 20 years after the religion started. Quote, Some 20,000 Numic people lived in today's Utah in 1847 in loosely confederated tribes. 20,000 Native Americans. Northern Shoshones, Western Shoshones, Goshutes, Utahs, and Southern Paiutes. Based on past experience with white traders, the Indian nations assumed the Mormons were merely visitors who had not come to stay. A tragic fatal flaw in their judgment. After promising the natives that the Mormons were peaceful and wouldn't encroach on their lands, tensions mounted during the winter and boiled over when several Mormons brutally murdered an Indian who had caught them poaching a deer. Local leaders believed they must abandon the settlement or fight the Utes. At a council held in Great Salt Lake City on January 31st, 1850, Parley Pratt thought it best to kill the Indians. When the question was put to a vote of the settlers, according to Higby, every man and boy held up their hand to kill them off. Willard Richards expressed the conclusion of the council, exterminate them, take no hostile Indians as prisoners. Militia commander Daniel Wells ordered, and let none escape but do the work up clean. In the subsequent battle at Fort Utah, the Saints suffered minimal casualties. In the aftermath of the fight, the militia executed 17 Ute prisoners on the ice of Utah Lake and enslaved their wives and children, end quote. One of the portions of this story is if they massacred everyone, supposedly, how do we know what happened? And I found that a very interesting sort of, a, it's not even a footnote, but the, the next chapter of the story. So flesh that out for us if you would. The period from 1848 to 1858 under Brigham Young was the most formative time for the Mormon theocracy in Utah, and this period is known as the Mormon Reformation. This is when Brigham Young widely published the polygamy doctrine, as and, and it was practiced openly. They didn't try and hide it, really. Um, and, and something that's lost oftentimes is the fact that Utah was a slave territory, uh, it, it, it was slated to be colonized. You know, Utah territory needed to be Europeanized, basically. And thus, the Native Americans were purged through multiple violent battles. Um, and, and 
for lack of better words, massacres because they didn't have it, you know, the battle between frontier American or, you know, uh, European settlers and Native Americans, it wasn't so much a battle as it was a slaughter. And Brigham Young used that to his advantage. Uh, there were 10 major battles or massacres with dozens of smaller conflicts, and they resulted in the deaths of thousands, thousands of Native Americans and extremely minimal casualties for the Mormons. War and but, genocide in the name of God. Who would have thought yeah. it, right? That's never happened before. And they didn't just stick with bullets and powder. Um, they were intentionally spreading sickness and also poisoning the Native Americans. There's an, a quote, left, uh, quote uh, that we found from a Mormon source that says that they were selling flour to the Native Americans that was laced with shards of glass in order to, you know, cut up their insides. So... Um, it was, it was for all intents and purposes, it was genocide and there's, there's no, no way of getting around that. And another thing we can't ignore also is the old world epidemics affecting the native Americans, because some historians have put the number at around 90%, maybe even 95% of the native Americans, uh, died to old world diseases that their immune systems just couldn't handle. And there's an account left behind of, uh, of the this Mormon exploratory troop uh, traveling past Wakara's Utahs. And they said, quote, they shot a young Pa Utah boy as a sacrifice that the sickness may stop. And the sickness was measles. So uh, the natives had no chance against the Mormons, unfortunately. And I, this is something that often gets lost in the conversation is we say, well, you know, the frontier Americans, they were killing off natives like crazy. You know, it was, it was happening all over America at the time. And I don't think that saying that should minimize the devastation and the number of human lives that were lost in this. It's sad to think that Native Americans are just thrown out as like, oh, yeah, you know, we we did kind of remove them from their lands and there was a trail of tears. And yeah, you know, it really sucks. But, you know, what about the Mount Meadows massacre? You know, that was 120 men, women and children there. You were Europeans that died. That was small potatoes compared to the thousands of Native Americans who were slaughtered at the hands of Mormons. And, you know, Utah was also a slave territory. They were trading slaves. They were human trafficking as well that was happening in Utah. So this is a very disgusting and bloody time in Mormon history. We come back to the Mountain Meadow Massacre. It's true that they left some of the youngest alive thinking they wouldn't have a memory of it, and yet they did recall, and that's how we know much about that. I don't know. Is that a wives tale or is it true? That's absolutely true. So uh, a little bit of background. People will have to go over to uh, listen to my spot on on Scathing Atheist when I talked about the Mountain Meadows Massacre in detail because it's such a huge issue in and of itself. But essentially, uh, one of the apostles of the church was uh, uh, killed in Arkansas at the same time that a wagon train, the Baker Fancher Party, was coming through the area. And Brigham Young was able to successfully blame this wagon party for the death of that apostle. And, you know, the, he was a beloved member of the Mormon community, the Mormon elite. So as they were traveling from Utah, the Mormons basically starved them out and forced them uh, to camp out in what was known as Mountain Meadows. That's just uh, west of Cedar City in Utah. And uh, the, the Mormons sieged their camp for five days and then ended up uh, doing a, a little false surrender tactic and uh, escorting them a few miles outside of Mountain Meadows. And then that's when they turned and, and shot all the men, women, and children. But they left people who were under the age of eight years old alive because they thought they wouldn't have memories of it. And luckily, they did that because otherwise we would not know much of the details that we know about it. Um, but to add into this, to show Brigham Young's uh, business-like perspective and his ruthless, cold-blooded tactics. He was the director of the Indian Affairs in Utah just as, at the same time he was governor when this massacre occurred. And the Indian Affairs office was able to bill the government for uh, when people would be looted by the Native Americans. So he was able to successfully blame the Native Americans for the Mountain Meadows Massacre. And he ended up billing the United States government for the possessions of the Baker Fancher Party that were looted. Um, and the government ended up paying back half of the bill to the tune of $2,500. So the Mormons killed the Baker Fancher party. They took all of their stuff. Then Brigham Young billed the government for the stuff that had been taken and the government paid half the bill. 
You know, it's interesting so, that the church, yeah. it seems like only in recent years, the last few recent years, publicly acknowledged the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Uh, it's true. Sort of swept under the rug. And then finally, I think the noise became so loud that they couldn't ignore it and they finally had to own it. Would that be an accurate way to say it? Absolutely. And at the time, Brigham Young did try to sweep it under the rug as well, but they didn't even bury the bodies uh, under, you know, six feet under. So unfortunately, they were dug up by coyotes and there were just, you know, bleached bones out of these these men, women and children all over the Mountain Meadows area. And it was because a, uh, a government troop actually went traveling through the area. The I believe it was one, maybe two years after the massacre happened, that they built a monument to them, which was basically just a stack of rocks. And they understood that if they didn't build that monument, then the Mount Meadows massacre would just be completely lost to history. So they they made the monument and then they went back and reported to the government what they had found during their trek. And of course, Brigham Young wasn't so happy about that. So is Brigham Young leading from a position of fear at this? I mean, is, he, is this like a fear cult or are, is he still inspiring people? You know, because I know there's a difference. I mean, is he oppressing the Mormons or is he, um, you know, does he just have that kind of power of persuasion? He was, um, he was a dictator. He was a tyrant. He was, um, by any objective measurement, Brigham Young was an evil human being. Absolutely disgusting. And there are three universities named after him. Right. And a city and uh, lots of roads. There are statues all over Utah of this guy. Um, and, and to show, to exhibit how Brigham Young dealt with problems, um, when he first took power, he essentially held a cleansing of, of Mormons to make sure that everybody was falling in line. Uh, in the early 1860s, there was a group called the Morrisites, led by a guy named Joseph Morris. So Joseph Morris went public with a revelation that he had been called as the seventh angel from the book of Revelation, and he demanded publicly that Brigham Young acknowledge his role in the millennium as a prophet. So Brigham Young refused to acknowledge Morris as a prophet, and the Morrisites broke off from the Utah Brighamite Church. And what followed was what was known as the Morrisite War, the Morrisite Battle. Um, <laughs> I, I have to qualify this a little bit. The Morrisites were not pleased with Brigham Young's rule. They knew about the Mountain Meadows Massacre, the Aiken Party murders. They were frustrated with the genocide of the natives. And there, there were just countless grievances that they had. So in 1861, this is when Joseph Morris excommunic- was excommunicated by the church, and the Morrisites were viewed as a group that were in open rebellion against the Utah theocracy. So the Morrisites held out in what was known as the Kingston Fort, and the Mormon militia, known as the Nauvoo Legion still, uh, with 500 to 1,000 soldiers, they sieged the fort with two cannons for three days. And the militia fired a warning shot at the the fort, and the shot actually bounced off of the ground and hit the fort, and which took out a wall. And at that time, it killed two women and shattered the jaw of a third woman. And after that shot was fired, the militia subsequently invaded the fort the next day. They killed Joseph Morris and a number of other of the Morrisites, and they took 90 people prisoner to stand trial for murder of one of the militiamen and for, quote-unquote, resistance. So... That's what what happened to you if you resisted Brigham Young or tried to start your own religion out there that was a break off from the Brighamite church. That makes and uh, he, shunning almost yeah. sound like a, kind of a gift. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 At, least, you know, at least they didn't execute me, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, it, it's really, when you step back and view Utah history, and particularly Mormon history in Utah through, you know, an entire cumulative timeline of Brigham Young, you kind of lose the veneer of, oh, wait, well, it's a religion. They were just practicing their free exercise of religion. They could do what they wanted. It does look like tyranny. It looks like, you know, um, a brutal dictator who is quashing out these small uprisings with an incredible amount of force. And and uh, it's it's violent. It's bloody. It's disgusting. Seeing as how we're sort of against the clock here, how do we get from the tyrant of Brigham Young to this sort of happy, clappy, whitewashed image of this perception of Brigham Young that most people have today? Well, we don't talk about it. 
That's how you lose you lose perspective of what happened in the past when the collective psyche is basically told to ignore what happened or to not worry about it or when they're taught to fear that information by it being labeled anti-Mormon. So much of what is written about Brigham Young is corroborated by Mormon historians, but the wider populace of Mormonism doesn't know much about um, Brigham Young and know much about the history of their own religion. In fact, it takes a lot of people learning the history of the church for them to realize just how bullshit the church is and actually leave and send in their letter. So uh, at all of this time when, when Brigham Young is building this theocracy, polygamy is also being widely practiced. Brigham Young had 55 wives. Um, Eventually, the government ended up seizing all of the assets of the church that were valued over fifty thousand dollars. They uh, they disincorporated the church. They dissolved the perpetual immigration fund, and a number of of uh, government pressures were finally put on the church after Brigham Young's death. That the church issued the eighteen ninety manifesto, which basically uh, squashed the practice of polygamy. And about fifteen to twenty years later, there were no more plural marriages being practiced, and that's when the new Mormon history came along, and the new public friendly version of Mormonism came along when Utah finally gained statehood, and they realized that they are not capable of building a theocracy within the confines of the United States. So they decided to just ignore the history and build monuments and and temples in the name of these people instead of trying to understand who they really were and what they have done. And to put some perspective on this, today there are over 400 different factions of Mormonism that are documented to have existed or currently exist. And dozens of these factions are fundamentalists practicing you know, polygamy illegally, and that forces them to operate underground, which severely limits the rights afforded to the women and children in these fundamentalist groups. So this has far-reaching implications, and much in the same way that we founded America with this idea that we have the right to bear arms and, you know, be, you know, the way that we control an oppressive government is by being able to take down that government. That's kind of the same with Mormonism. It was created in this desert by hardworking people who were scraping by and, you know, locked in destitution and they were somehow able to make it work. And that same like strong spirit mindedness is captured by the church today and by the members themselves, they still practice this this um, excitement and stalwart beliefs and they put forward this beautiful face and you know this friendliness when they, you don't realize what is you know what lays behind in the war path of Mormonism. I can see somebody who was raised in that culture. I remember the American Atheist National Convention which was held in Salt Lake City, Utah and we walked out of the convention hall and looked around and and the temples were amazing. I mean, they were yes. they were beautiful. Great and, and spacious buildings. And you think, you know, all the artistry and the architecture and the inspiration and all these things. And if you only look at the surface, again, they just look like happy and well-decorated weird people. <laughs> but <laughs> but it's, it's this sort of, um, you know, this dark underlayer, this underbelly that uh, people are now being made aware of more than ever. Do you bring these things up when you're talking to Mormons in your own conversations? It's very hard to broach these subjects with Mormons um, because they they don't know enough about this to put the information into context, which is why I really like going to Mormon history conferences because you meet people there who are interested in the history, who are historians, who believe in the church, who understand so much of this darker, disgusting side of Mormon history, but they're still somehow able to reconcile their beliefs. And I do have some level of appreciation of being able to um, understand that and still believe in something, I think it's fundamentally flawed and that we shouldn't believe in something like Mormonism, but the ability to intellectually wrestle with these hard issues and come by them honestly instead of just saying, those are anti-Mormon lies, don't talk to me about them. I think that shows some level of honesty that is you know, commendable at some level. You mentioned earlier that you have a show. What is that? Yeah, so what my show is is I uh, I do the Naked Mormonism podcast, and basically what happened when I started learning Mormon history about five years ago, I looked for a podcast that went through and told the story of Mormonism from day one in chronological format, 
and I couldn't find it anywhere. So I decided to make that because the way that I'm able to understand things is in a chronological systematic format. So I decided to start with the birth of Joseph Smith and evolve chronologically from there. And this, this five year endeavor so far, um, has been wildly fascinating learning Mormon history at this much deeper level that I never knew. And I never appreciated when I was a Mormon. And, and one of my takeaways from learning all of this history is if I would have known this, if the average chapel attending Mormon would have known this about the history of Brigham Young or the history of the foundation of the church, they would do everything in their power to distance themselves from their early roots, especially when it comes to Utah and bloody Brigham Young. But instead, we have towns and universities and dozens of statues throughout Utah that pay homage to this objectively despicable human being that is Brigham Young. I mean, he was a misogynistic theocrat with over 50 wives. He was indescribably wealthy. He had thousands of um, he had thousands of soldiers at his command. He effectively squashed every uprising or dissenter. He was disturbingly racist, claiming that two people of different races intermarrying deserved the death penalty on the spot. Thousands of people died at Brigham Young's command. Tens of thousands lived in absolute destitution while he lived and ate like a king, and his marriage of state and church authority being the same entity under his sole iron-fisted control represents one of the most tragic flaws in American history when the powers of government were so tightly intertwined with a few wealthy religious elite. So, while we're sitting back and re-examining our history and we're tearing down statues of Civil War Confederate generals, maybe we should examine whether or not Brigham Young left a legacy worth you know, reverence and veneration. Maybe we should really take a look at these statues and ask ourselves if this is, if this is the best way to approach Mormon history. Naked Mormonism, is that right? That's correct, yes. All right, well, I'll include a link to that in the description box. People can go and and follow your work as you carry the golden plates up to Mount Morbidor, <laughs> throw into the lava pit, you know, to dismantle, to, to cease the evil. Um, but it's been an interesting discussion. I know we've just scratched the surface, so I'll include the link to your work in the description box. Bryce Blankenagle, thanks for uh, talking to us. It's, you know, it's something that most people don't know about, but I think they should know, many want to know, and uh, so you're doing great work. Thank you for that. Thank you very much, Seth. And if you don't mind, I'd just like to leave people with a bit of a parting thought. Yeah, please do. I've come to kind of a, a little bit of a conclusion, and this is based on my optimism and probably a healthy dose of ignorance of how the real world operates. But this observation fueling my optimism is the deterioration and the entropy of the sad to see crowd. I mean, you know the type of people, Seth, you know, the people who say that they're they're sad to see how bad things have gone lately. They're sad to see how much God has been taken out of our schools. They're sad to see gas prices, what they are. Um, you know, they 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 fawn over this world where cars could withstand a crash and the hospital bill for their birth was $60. And, you know, homosexuality and transgenderism were just sexual depravity. You know, they're they're sad to see their Second Amendment being taken away. They're sad to see a depraved world that's ruled by the adversary. But it requires taking a step back and trying to understand what their real concern is. We can't understand why people say they're sad to see these things without validating their argument and empathizing with their perspective and then, you know, debunking that argument. But personally, I think it's they're, the, the fact that they're just sad to see society moving in directions unfamiliar to them. They're scared of change. Now, we as atheists may not take much from the Bible, but it's worth taking some lessons to heart when applicable. And Jesus dealt with the Sadducees by educating them. And, you know, at the time that we're recording this, Seth, there's actually a movement that's headed by an active member of the church named Sam Young. And this movement is called Protect LDS Children. And what Sam Young has done is he's organized a march on March 30th in Salt Lake City to deliver a petition to the church office building in Salt Lake. And this petition is to stop the church from sexually explicit one-on-one -on -one bishops interviews behind closed doors that are conducted at regular interval intervals in a Mormon's life. And in this campaign, he's collected over 400 stories from Mormons and ex-Mormons, and they'll be included in this packet that he delivers. 
This is a, a way of civil protest within the church. Sam Young is fighting the sad to seize. And this is, this is happening everywhere. Kids are taking part in the democratic process by protesting at school, the only place that their voice can be heard, to fight the sad to seize. We shouldn't punish these movements. We should celebrate the fact that they exist as they should in our democracy. So I think that it's important to understand that maybe we should continue fighting the Sadducees as much as we possibly can. And I think Nelson Mandela told us the best way to do that. Education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. So all of that said, I'm excited to see how, how things are shaping up. And I'm very optimistic about how society is, is dealing with these extremely fundamental problems of our society. And, you know, if we zoom far enough back, maybe we can look at this optimistically and say the world is becoming a better place. It may be doing so slowly. There may be blips where things seem to get worse, but all in all, the trajectory of humanity is in a positive direction. And that makes me extremely hopeful for the future of humanity. Bryce Blankenagle, thanks so much. It's been a real joy talking to you, man. It's been an honor. Thank you, Seth.